Good evening. My name is Emily and I'm with the Miami University Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual wine tasting with Jack Keegan. Jack is an instructor emeritus who taught the ever popular viticulture and enology class at Miami for 25 years and is actually still teaching three nights this semester. Jack's wine class is always full. His chapter wine tastings are well attended and tonight is no exception as we have a lot of alumni um, family and friends joining us. The Miami University Alumni Association is so excited for the opportunity to bring Jack to you as we celebrate the Charter Day, um, Miami's Charter Day. So there is an ask a question box located at the bottom of the screen. I'll be monitoring these questions, so please feel free to ask questions you may have, and I will relay them to Jack throughout the tasting. And with all of that being said, go ahead and take it away, Jack. Great. Thanks, Emily. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. It should be a fun evening. There's some good values and some interesting wines from around the world. So that's in fact what we'll do. Um, of course, as I normally do, this is the list of wines and how we will taste them. So the Riando Prosecco Rosé Extra Dry, the Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc from uh, New Zealand, the Louis Jadot Macon Village Burgundy, the Chapoutier Belrouche Blanc, which is of course a white, Côte de Rome from France, the, Oak, the Acrobat Pinot Noir from Oregon and the Brancia Tre, uh, Italy. It's a Rosso Toscano, it's actually an IGT as we'll talk about in a bit, from Italy. So again, as I don't like to talk without starting a, a wine, let's start with the wine, shall we? Uh, the first thing I will do, of course, is, as I have practically every time, show you how to open a bottle of sparkling wine. This, of course, is the Riondo Prosecco. And we'll talk a bit more about it. But first, let me open it and we can taste it. And then we'll talk a little bit more about it. The problem ends up being with these things, and I don't know if it's because I'm a lefty, is there's a little tab. I don't know if you have that, if you can see that. There's a little tab on that. You may be having the same difficulty I am pulling this tab up. In fact, I may just sort of say, too bad. I will just pull this thing down without finding the tab because it doesn't want me to, to do that. And that's what I will do to pull off the top. As I typically say, John Dome, of course, and I agree with him completely, he taught the wines class before me, that I never take the entire capsule off the bottle, just the top. So in fact, I'm sorry to rip things up a bit, but there, I've done that very nicely, or at least I've done it. I'm not sure very nicely is the thing for that. But again, you see, of course, that the tab is down. And as you now know, you give it six turns, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there it's open. I usually leave the cage, which is the top on there. And then of course, turn the bottle while holding the cork. And as you can see, it's raising up very, very nicely. And so I keep it under control the entire time. So I usually get a nice, which is in fact, what is good to have. And what's nice is too, with that, you get the first aroma of the wine. Again, a fact was alum who very nicely bought me this glass so I thought I would use it tonight again lots of bubbles and because it's a nice glass and doesn't hold a lot I'll add a little bit more Riondo is not made like champagne uh, it is made in fact what we call the Charmat or the bulk process but again Beautiful bubbles. I mean, very, very nicely. I hope you can see that fine. Uh, they're not like super fine, but very, very nice. And again, if you smell this wine, and of course, you don't really have to swirl it very much because the aromas will come because of the bubbles. I, I find this wine, again, sort of a minerally and also fleshy. And so, I mean, it really has a, it has a, a depth to it. It has a, almost like a, a, thickness to it. As I said, it, uh, again, for lack of a better term, almost fleshy because it's not super lean. It actually has a roundness to it. Now, this is extra dry. And so we'll also obviously have some sweetness, a very nice pink color, almost that, you know, with that extremely pale pink. And by the way, this is a pink Prosecco, which is brand new. Up until I think a year ago, all Proseccos, in fact, were white. And we'll talk a little bit more about that also. So again, uh, nice fruit, a little bit, you know, almost a little bit of nuttiness there too. And of course, if you taste this wine. Mm. 
clean. Some really nice, there is some sweetness. But because of the good acidity that is there, you don't really mind the sweetness at all. In fact, I think it's very nicely balanced. And this wine has some has some depth to it. Um, I mean, really is very nice in that sort of very full bodied for a sparkling wine, I think, especially for a Prosecco. Um, a little bit about this wine. Um, it is, in fact, from the area basically in the Veneto, as you can see, the north east corner of Italy. And uh, and you can see it's just right above Treviso. I, in fact, I almost went to make some pictures. When I took students over there in 2013, or excuse me, 2011, um, we had the morning on Sunday in Treviso. And it was really such a beautiful town. And then we went up into the, what again was there called basically the Prosecco Hills. Uh, in there. And so you can see that there's, in fact, a fairly large area and make Prosecco. Um, this is a little, mm, you know, maybe a, a little um, sort of going into some depth, but there are a number of different categories of Prosecco. And this is one thing too important. For example, a while ago, we had the Di Faveri, and it, in fact, was, again, several above these, but you don't really have to worry about or they can be different levels of quality, but this is perfectly good drinking. And you can see in the bottom, there is Prosecco DOC, uh, of course, and from Treviso around there, uh, which has many, many towns, a very, very large area. Above that is Prosecco Superiore, as you can see, and there's like 17 from that area also. The ones I actually look for I will be honest with you, is the ones that say Corneliano Valdebiadene. Try saying that fast three times. Um, these are the two major towns that are there that are really the heart of the Prosecco region. And so when you get a, a Prosecco from Corneliano or Valdebiadene, and very often the two words are together, um, they are, in fact, just a little bit of a finer wine, but typically will also be very a little more expensive. At the top, which again, I would say you probably have to spend maybe 35 or $40 for, as you can see in the town of Valdebiadene, is Superiore di Cartesi. The Cartesi is, as you can see, 107 hectares, which if I can do the math really fast, probably about 270 acres, is that whole, the very central sort of heart area of Prosecco. Uh, and so it is the best of the best. And in fact, can be very, very, very good uh, in all of this. Uh, the grape is Glera, as you can see. As I've mentioned before, but again, it's always good to sort of recap. The grape used to be called Prosecco. But the problem is, if the name of the grape is used, you can use that name everywhere throughout the world. And so, in fact, one of the places was Brazil. They were making a Prosecco in Brazil. Obviously, the Italians did not like that or want that. So consequently, they went to an older name, which was Glera. So if you want to make a Glera in Brazil, have at it. You simply can't call it Prosecco because it's not the name of the grape anymore. And so this is, in fact, the grape that you normally see in a Prosecco. In fact, actually, to be a Prosecco, it has to be 85% glera. Uh, beautiful hills, these rolling hills up there in very close to the Dolomite Mountains. Just absolutely beautiful areas. Lots of small landowners. Uh, in fact, well, as we'll see, here's another picture, in fact, I think, of the Cartesi. Um, this is, as you can see, the ultra-modern winemaking for, you can see, Cantine Riondo uh, in there. It's actually part of a larger, um, this is actually a consortium or I, um, where there's a number of different owners. Uh, I think that altogether there's over 500 and some different owners of vineyard land who then are part of this. Uh, and so this is actually what you're dealing with. And altogether, they own about 14,000 acres of grapes, which is truly amazing when you think about it. Uh, it is named, in fact, I, I tried and tried to find a better picture of this. Obviously, this is the middle of winter. This is Malt 
Riondo. And so Riondo is actually named for the mountain that is there. And I looked and looked to find one when it was green, but obviously not. So it is, in fact, one of the hillsides that is there. And so the wine is named, in fact, for that mountain in uh, this area. Uh, again, some pictures from Riondo. As you can see, they're getting ready, in fact, to pick. You can see the full thing of Glera there. And, of course, the vineyard, this sort of wonderful sort of aerial view uh, of that. Uh, again, this is another picture from them. A lot of the Riondo um, that they do serve, in fact, has screw caps, which is sort of a nice thing. Because, again, they don't just make uh, Prosecco. And, by the way, very, very few, but you can actually have a Prosecco that has no bubbles. It's the same as you can have a champagne that has no bubbles, but they're very few and far between. And so I would be surprised if you could easily found, find one maybe outside of New York or San Francisco or someplace like that, or possibly, in fact, Italy itself in all of that. The way Prosecco is made is in a tank. And this is a picture I took when I, in fact, had taken students over there. And so we visited uh, Bortolotti. Uh, and so this is a typical tank. You see there's some rounded tops to it because this is under pressure. So first they make a wine. Again, typically 100% glera. Uh, in this case, this wine is 90% glera, 10%, uh, if you're Italian, Pinot Nero, Pinot Noir. Uh, and of course, that's what gives it its color. The, you make a wine, you then put it into the tank. It could be 5,000 gallons or more. You add yeast to it. You add sugar to it. And so you have a second fermentation in the tank. Typically, we're in, Italy, we're in, excuse me, in Champagne. You have to spend 15 months in the bottle. Here, there is, I don't even know if there is actually a minimum, but this typically only spends about two months in tank. I've had other Proseccos that have spent eight months, 12 months, or longer. And typically, the longer the tank, the more you will get some of the secondary constituents, in fact, from the yeast. And so this doesn't really have much of that at all. Here again are the words that I talked about. It's an extra dry. Uh, it's 1.6% sugar, which it seems drier than that. I mean, that's a decent amount of sugar, but it doesn't seem dry, that uh, sweet to me. Uh, as you can see, it's a DOC Prosecco Rosé. It's 90% glare, as I mentioned. 10% Pinot Nero, which is Pinot Noir. Uh, cold maceration, so typically they allow the grapes to sit before fermentation. And then, of course, a cool fermentation. And as I said, secondary in those pressurized tanks that we saw for two months. So really, I mean, an easy drinking glass of rosé. Spring is coming, honest. Uh, in fact, that was one of the reasons I bought these tulips today uh, was because, in fact, spring is coming and it will not be long. In fact, someone put today, if they ever thought about it, you know, it's like a month from now, it will be the first day of spring. So it won't be very long. Though, I should tell you, um, in Oxford, at least is what they're saying currently, on next Thursday, we're supposed to get six inches of snow. So uh, we'll, we will try to be ready for it and maybe have another glass of Prosecco in the meantime for all of that. Okay, so that's our first wine. Some things I wanted to talk to you, as I normally like to do, is really discuss what's happening in the world of wine. And these are things, in fact, that for the most part have happened this week. Um, it was major. Schaefer, uh, that makes, of course, their Hillside Select. Uh, they make another wine called, I think, Relentless, etc. They are one of the icons of Napa Valley wines and go for very high prices. They were actually bought by a Korean department store for over $250 million. So in fact, the Schaefer family certainly has been able to cash in big time. That's a that's a lot of money for that, uh, for that property. And so it will be interesting to see how all of that goes. So, but that has happened uh, to them. Uh, but they are leaving the winemaking team, including the Schaefer's, uh, on premise. Um, and that, that's interesting too. Livex, which you may not be familiar with, Livex is the basically the um, the Wall Street or the um, uh, trading floor for wines, and much of that, of course, is Bordeaux and Burgundies. But California wines have increased tremendously, and as you can see, the prices of the top ones, things like Staglin, Screaming Eagle, etc., have risen 32% in the past year on Livex. Again, it can be older vintages, but in fact, it is very interesting. The opposite too, Bordeaux, which is in fact considered to be the, you know, 
sort of the standard bearer of tradition is considering using hybrid grapes. Let's face it, climate change is real. And they are worried about how their wines will fare and what they can do about growing grapes. And so they're actually looking at various kinds of grapes, at least obviously an experimental basis for that. The French, of course, are very happy in the same light that, in fact, I saw this week that their wines and spirits exports hit $17.6 billion. That's up 28 percent over 2020. And of course, 2020 was a bit of a lower, but still even better than 2019 in all of that. Speaking again of global warming difficulties, diurnal shift means the difference between the day temperature and the night temperature. And as you know, typically it gets cool at night. Well, one of the real problems has been in many places, especially in cities, is that the nights are not getting as cool as they used to. And especially cities are heat islands where they will stay much warmer at night. That diurnal shift, that cool nights, which we've typically had, and this, of course, is one of the places they're talking about was Oregon, is that it keeps the acid in the wine. It makes the wine better in many ways. And by losing those cool nights, it's going to change how the wines are going to taste because nothing is more sensitive to those things than wine uh, or to grapes. And so this is really a worry for them. Um, on another note, good for the, the French. I guess I'm sort of happy with the French today. Americans brought 34 million bottles of champagne in 2021. That was a 19% increase over 2019. The other thing that we worry about, and again, possibly climate change, was the thing. San Francisco has gone now 42 days without rain in the winter, and that is a record. The record, the all-time record, is 46. Now, in some ways, the Californians are very lucky because they had torrential rains at the end of December, and so they really filled up their reservoirs and they recharged a lot of the soil. The problem with this weather. And of course, if you watch the Super Bowl, you saw how warm it was down in LA. And the problem is they're starting to worry about bud break. Obviously, you can get frost all the way into early May in California. And so you don't want buds breaking in February. And so they are looking for some cooler weather. Now, it may rain in uh, San Francisco tomorrow, but I looked at the forecast in Healdsburg and Sonoma, and they had another 10 days without rain. And so this is certainly a problem. And I've actually heard from several winemakers uh, you know, on TV, et cetera, about talking about that and worrying about it. So those are some of the things that are happening in the world of wine. Other things, would you pay $95 for a box wine? Uh, Tablas Creek, which is a very good producer of mainly Rhone wines and Rhone blends um, and are very well respected. Uh, they decided that they would serve or they would sell their rosé in a three liter box. And normally three liters is equivalent to four bottles of wine. And so if you were to buy that wine in, you know, again, as they normally would sell it in a bottle, four bottles would cost you, I think, $112. So you're actually saving. And of course, they were thinking about less carbon footprint, etc. So they decided that they were going to put out a boxed wine at $95. And they only made 324 of them, and they sold out in four hours. So for them, it was, in fact, a very, very good deal. I see another one at 65. But let's face it, most boxed wines are in the $30 range. And so for this, you know, and that acceptance, of course, in a smaller period, makes it very, very interesting. Of course, if you have some excess money to spend, Grand Manier has just unveiled its quintessence. Of course, Grand Manier being the orange liqueur. This one, of course, uses some very, very old cognacs in the blend, etc. And of course, this one comes in a Baccarat crystal um, decanter. And so it's yours for $3,000. They only made, I think, a couple hundred of these. Uh, so again, if you're in the interest of something that's sort of almost one of the kind, there it is for you. One other thing I want to say before we get too much, and you probably heard it first here, is again, obviously because of COVID, we have not had the performing arts wine tasting in a good while. And so I wanted to announce the 31st annual. In fact, we are doing it with alumni because in fact, we're doing it on June 12th, which is alumni weekend. 
We're doing it from two to five at the Oxford Community Arts Center. Many of you would know as Ox College. Uh, there will be more information coming to you, but I think it could be a, a very special event. So I, I thought I would put that out there as a little bit of a teaser so you would in fact know about it before anyone else did. So put it in your calendar. A, a, another wonderful reason to come to Oxford in the summer, okay? Um, also, I was lucky enough, you know, again, it's who you have. I, I, uh, one of my former students is now the assistant winemaker at Stolen. And so I wrote him today and said, so what are things looking like in Oregon? And so these are pictures I got from him today of their vineyards. And you can see, in fact, these are very fairly old vines. And of course, it was foggy all morning. It didn't break off until, in fact, about lunchtime when he took those pictures today. And so here are some close-ups. One of the things I talk about in class and you may not know, you see the trunk, you see the arms or the cordons that come out. And then if you look very carefully, you will see the canes, or in this case, two bud spurs on the ends of all of those, because those buds will make the fruit for the next year. And so this is, in fact, is a vine and how many vines throughout the world are pruned. Uh, it's interesting, especially being in Oregon, the, the cordon is low. The other thing I didn't notice until right now, though, they may have to worry about water sometimes. And so, in fact, you see the irrigation line that is on there also. Uh, here's another picture, of course, of that same area that he, in fact, took for me. Uh, this, of course, is a totally different method of, of training where you have the trunk, but in this case, you don't have the cord on, or maybe they're rebuilding. No, they aren't because they're all the same. And so you literally just have two long canes going along what would be the arms of the cord on. And so, of course, each one of those buds will form the new shoot. And that, in fact, is how that, um, that plant, in fact, will be grown that year. I have to talk to him and see if it's different varieties, et cetera. He was busy, so I just got the pictures, and that was about it today, which was very, very nice for all of that. Okay. We might as well try now. Any questions, Emily? Yeah, we have yeah. one um, specifically about the Prosecco. Okay. Um, Judith wants to know Does all Prosecco come from the same region in Italy? Is it controlled like Champagne is? And she said, like, you can only call it. Prosecco if it's from this certain region? Yes, very good question. And in fact, you're, she's absolutely correct. Um, as you saw in the, the, um, the pyramid that I showed, uh, again, your basic wine will be called Prosecco, and that's all you'll see on the label, as you can see on the Riondo, if you have it, or in fact, a number of other Proseccos. And then there's a quality increase. And so I always look for um, if I can, and of course, I've had many good Proseccos that don't say this, but I look for the Conigliano of Valdebiadene. Uh, those two towns basically have the best vineyards and so typically make the best wines. But it is, in fact, what we would call a delimited area. And so once you're out of that area, you cannot call that wine Prosecco. You can have, and again, the, the term in Italy for sparkling is spumante. And so you can have uh, spumante wines from a number of places, Franciacorta, obviously Asti Spumante, uh, but to be called Prosecco, it has to come, in fact, from a specific region. Okay? Yep, and that is um, the only question related to this wine. Um, we have other questions, but they're more general, so we can save those sure. for the we'll end. We'll start with the next one, and we'll do yep. those right after this, then. That's great. So, wine number two. Uh, is actually one of the most widely sold wines in America, certainly the most widely sold Sauvignon Blanc, but has an interesting, a, two reasons, of course, I got them. A, I think it's a ve it's very often a good value, uh, typically delicious, uh, and has a very interesting sort of story and history with it. And, you know, and I will tell you, uh, I might have mentioned this in one of the earlier, if you like Sauvignon Blancs from New Zealand, buy them now because they are getting ready, of course, to pick the grapes for 2022, but those will not be made into wine at the earliest, like De December or January of 23. The problem is, was the 2021 crop, which they picked last March, was affected tremendously the previous October, November by frost. 
And so Sauvignon Blancs are going to be in short supply this year and probably, in fact, at least for the next year because of that. So if you like Kim Crawford or as someone mentioned Oyster Bay or Cloudy Bay or there's a number of excellent, excellent producers out of New Zealand, you might want to stock up because, in fact, they've had some real problems with frost this past year. So this is a Kim Crawford. We might as well try it first. It, of course, is in a screw cap, as you can see there. Fairly easy, of course, then to take it off and to pour a bit. Mine seems to be, and it might be slightly, I was thinking there might be a little bubbles in that. Maybe not. I thought when I poured it, maybe it was, but I don't see any right now in there. So let's look at this wine and taste it. The first thing, of course, you see it's very pale in color. You know, again, that pale straw kind of idea, very, very light, which, of course, is very typical of Sauvignon Blanc, and especially from one young as this is from New Zealand, and especially from Marlborough in there. Again, if you swirl, in this case, now you can, and smell this wine. It is quintessential Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. It has that, you know, again, it just sort of almost attacks your nose. It's got that really wonderful acid that is there. If you've ever had, and especially the English, really like gooseberries, uh, a gooseberry full or kiwi, um, maybe a little bit of a pepperiness to it also, it's there in spades. I mean, it really has just that really wonderful sort of gooseberry fruit to it. Maybe a little, pa in fact, actually a little passion fruit also. Wow. It's just, it is just so typical of a, uh, of a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And of course, if you taste it, Mm. Crisp, so clean, wonderful acid. This is where you get um, a lot of the greenness, you know, um, jalapenos without the heat uh, sort of comes to off. Almost a little bit of green beans, uh, too. So it really has a wonderful vegetalness to it. Um, it's interesting. Obviously, the acid is there, but it's not too acidic. It really does have some roundness to it that makes it not like, whoa, this is, you know, it's like almost too much. It really does, in fact, have a very, very nice flavor to it. Oh, and yeah, that, almost that wonderful stony minerality that begins coming out in the nose. Yeah, a little bit of chalk also. Beautiful summing of luck. There's absolutely no question. So, a little bit about this wine. First of all, of course, it is from the Marlborough region, which, of course, is there at, um, I guess you would say, the northern part of the South Island. When they, In fact, you see underneath it says exotic tropical Sauvignon Blancs, which, in fact, is very, very true in there. By the way, the further north you go, the warmer it gets because we're in the southern hemisphere. In the south, of course, you see central Otago, which, in fact, is known more and more for its Pinot Noirs, uh, etc. Absolutely beautiful countryside in all of this. This is Kim Crawford. Many people, of course, don't think of Kim as being a male's name, but of course it is typically, of course, unisexual. And so this, of course, is Kim Crawford. And I certainly found out that Kim Crawford, who of course gave the name to the wine, no longer is associated with Kim Crawford. He actually, in fact, makes his own wines called Love Block now. Uh, and has, in fact, for a number of years, he sold, in fact, the winery to Constellation, and they own that. They also own Nobilo uh, and a couple of other wineries in New Zealand. And so, in fact, he sold a number of years ago and then started his own, with his wife, uh, uh, winery. Um, I cannot tell you how, off, how much I look to find a picture of the winery. And this was the best I could do. I spent uh, a couple hours trying, you know, various ways. And of course, you see all the tanks that are there. Obviously, Kim Crawford makes tens of thousands of gallons of Sauvignon Blanc every year uh, from a number of different um, uh, areas in, uh, in or a number of different uh, vineyards, 
uh, in the area. Uh, and so, of course, is a big winery. As I said, the number one selling Sauvignon Blanc in the United States with this. The vineyards, uh, again, through these areas are just absolutely beautiful. As you can see, here is one of their vineyards. Here, of course, you can see them, in fact, harvesting uh, the grapes, again, not surprisingly, with a mechanical harvester uh, that shakes the grapes off of the vine and this gorgeous scenery uh, there. Really interesting, too. You know, and of course, I had sort of forgotten about this, you know, because it, a couple of years ago, there were the tremendous earthquakes in Christchurch and some other places. Marlborough is, is literally right on the edge of where the two plates come together uh, in the tectonic plates. And so it is, in fact, a very, very high uh, area of earthquakes, etc. But it's also, of course, not surprisingly, had um, uh, glaciers. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the soil, in fact, is glacial teal or has come from that from the last ice age. We tend not to think about that in the Southern Hemisphere as much, but that, in fact, is where it's from. And just really, really interesting places and soils. Um, I also have a few other pictures. In fact, you can see in the area. Uh, this is thanks, in fact, to Jen Adams, uh, who is a Miami alum. Both she and her husband are Miami alums. She is now a GP uh, down working, in fact, in Renwick, which is right in the Marlboro area. And she was kind enough to send me pictures uh, probably, in fact, of what the place looks like in the last week. So I thought that was really pretty interesting and very, very nice. So this beautiful picture, of course, of the vineyards uh, there as getting towards, I imagine, sunset. Uh, and I would certainly think this is Sauvignon Blanc uh, ripening. They're probably still three or four weeks away uh, from, uh, from harvest. Uh, but there you see them at, at the edge of that. There's a close-up, in fact, of the New Zealand grapes or the, the um, Sauvignon Blanc grapes uh, there in New Zealand. So I have to thank Jen for sending me pictures uh, to uh, for you to all see what it looks like in New Zealand at the moment. Makes it a lot of fun to see because, of course, they're working their way into fall and harvest as we, of course, are working our way into spring, even though it seems like a very slow crawl into spring. Again, Classic Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, lifted citrus, tropical fruits, crushed herbs. Uh, they say tropical fruit flavors, passion fruit, melon, and grapefruit. Brilliant with oysters, asparagus, lobster, summer salads. Got 93 from the, the tasting panel. I can see that bright peach appears in the nose and fruits, fresh and juicy palate, along with racy acidity. Um, Williford Wong at wine.com, who I, who I think does a very good job spot on, which is certainly true. Excellent typicity and richness. Tasting notes, uh, aromas of dried herbs, grapefruit peel, and mineral notes. Enjoy with raw oysters or freshly squeezed lemon. I'm not sure I'd go with freshly squeezed lemon completely, but it still is a beautiful Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, yeah, that one, uh, just that wonderful aromas. I don't get so much peach. I really get much more into the kiwi. Questions? Emily. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. Yes, they are coming in. <laughs> um, so first one, does a screw cap or cork influence the quality of the wine? Very good question. Any wine that should be drunk within one to three years of bottling can go into either. And, and I would say uh, the thing that's interesting too, again, technology, of course, gets better all the time. One of the things about aging wines is that Often with a cork, you do have a little bit of air going through the cork. And so it does factor into aging. Typically, if no air goes through uh, from a screw cap, uh, the wine will age more slowly. But they now make screw caps, which do allow varying amounts of oxygen to get through for the aging process. So I would say generally no, but I have seen studies even in a short time where because of that air, there are slightly different, there are slight differences between a screw cap and a, uh, and a cork. Typically the 
not surprisingly, the screw cap keeps it a little fresher. But both of them, in fact, are will be very drinkable. So good question. Next. Yep. So how many grapes does it take to make one bottle of wine? Oh, I wish I had these kinds of numbers in my head. Uh, it actually doesn't take, surprisingly, not many. Depending on the size of the cluster, you could probably make a, a bottle of wine in about four or five clusters of grapes. If there's enough juice in there um, to, in fact, make a 750 milliliter bottle. Are you um are you going to talk about the what you did with your class earlier this week? What you were telling me on Wednesday with the red uh, and the, the skin? I certainly I certainly can. In fact, maybe we'll do that. In fact, if, if remind me, I'll probably remember also then when we talk about the uh well, I'll do that one over the red wines. In fact, okay, perfect. And yeah, because I want to talk about it, but in fact, actually I was talking to somebody today. It's like the next time we do one of these, um, we will in fact I will make everybody participate. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, let me see. The, oh, actually, yeah, there is another one about this specific wine. Um, does Kim Crawford, the brand, does it, do they make anything other than Sauvignon Blanc? Uh, yes, they do. In fact, they make a rosé. Uh, I actually, I have to look back to see their entire portfolio, but they make a number of different wines. No, nope, okay. good question. They make a number of different wines. Yeah. I like the rosé. Uh, in fact, I like the rosé very much. Um, kind of in that same vein, two people messaged um, saying that they got the Illuminate Kim Crawford Kim Crawford Savion Blanc. So it's only 7% alcohol. Um, so it's a lighter wine. Is there really a difference between that wine and this wine, do you think? Like, what's the difference with the less percentage of alcohol? Wow, what a great question. And and now I really, because again, while I was doing this, I saw the names, etc. And I didn't really look at it. You know what it is. Uh, and again, I almost, <laughs> I'll be honest, I almost hate to mention it, but something that, of course, has been increasing in popularity is dry January and these ideas about wines. And of course, and, and I'll be honest, you know, I mean, why is Kim Crawford making that wine? Because of the, again, seltzers and the ready to drink. Um, uh, cans of spirits and all the things that are out there. Um, it's funny again, because one of my, uh, again, another one of my former students works at Chai Vineyards and they make a, I can't remember the exact name, Sunny with a chance of, I forget exactly what, it's, exactly what it is, but again, these lower alcohol wines are appealing to the segment of the population who worries about, and again, we should all of that watch our alcohol intake. But in fact, making these wines that are lighter in alcohol. And I would say for the most part, and actually, I'm not going to say anything because I haven't tasted it. And so it would not be fair for me to say, oh, well, it's going to taste lighter. Well, obviously, it'll taste lighter. It'll certainly taste less alcoholic. But I have not tasted or compared the two. So I don't want to make a blanket statement. But I will certainly, I wonder if they're, in fact, I don't even know if it's, this wine is in Ohio. Uh, I will certainly check to find out because I know the shy vineyard one is not, and I just haven't had the chance to go to Kentucky because I know it's in Kentucky, um, uh, to try them out. And I would like to try them. So that's really interesting. But it is. It is one of those trends that is going on and has continued to um, have obviously have dominated. Um, I'll be honest, you know, the wine industry is wondering uh, with everything going on between COVID, et cetera, it's like, Will will the generation which is starting to drink drink wine, and in fact, uh, and to an extent, you know, and there will be some drink at all. America, of course, has has more teetotalers than other Western countries, so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with that. A bit of a long answer for like I don't know, uh, but um, uh, but that in fact is how it is. Thank you. Perfect. I know how you. Um, I know you don't like my seltzers. But <laughs> all right, that is the only one, the only questions related to this bottle of wine. So I'll save the rest for the end. Great, great. So let's see where we are. We are actually going to France. Uh, I thought that was a uh, sort of a, an interesting idea, not to mention for a number of reasons with this wine uh, in there. So we are, in fact, off to uh, France. 
Uh, and actually, we're off to Burgundy. I should go back there for a second. And in fact, this shows, if you look carefully at the bottom, you can see, of course, where the, the entire country. And of course, you're seeing this very long hillside. And then the bottom of this map is this. And that is around the town of Macon. You have, of course, the Maconnet. Uh, and so there are a number of villages around there. Uh, one of the reasons, in fact, and I'm going to just stop here for a second to let you look. And again, if you decide to write things down or not, it's totally up to you. Or you can always take a quick picture. Look at some of these areas that are here. Certainly at the bottom, you see the town of Macon. And around the town of Macon is, in fact, probably the most famous area of this in the south. And that's Puy Frise. Puy Frise, two different towns, Puy and Frise, became, you know, in the probably the 2000s, people for some reason learned to say it and they loved saying that name. And so the wine sold, basically flew off the shelves. And, and that was a little bit of a problem for them because there was so much demand that they got a little sloppy. I, you know, in other words, in other words, overcropping. And so the wines, I'll be honest, were not quite as good. Luckily, they've learned their lesson. And so you can, in fact, buy delicious Puy Frises. And that is probably the most common wine, or certainly in the better. And I've seen them, you know, $20, $25. They can go up, in fact, to $50, depending on what you're buying in there. The other places that I want you to pay attention to, though, of course, we're having a Macon village. Um, typically, of course, you see the large area is just called Macon. And those wines are certainly drinkable, but nothing to write home about. Macon village, which you can see is a much smaller area. Um, again, as you know, not very expensive, but I find the quality in a, a decent vintage, as this one was, uh, absolutely amazing. But the other places I want you to notice is saint Varin, uh, which is there sort of on the left. They make wonderful wines. And again, for not a lot of money, because people don't know them. I found very few wines from Puy Vinzels or Puy Leche, but I am seeing more wines as you go sort of up the map uh, from Vire Classe. Uh, and so, and they also make very good wines. So they're sort of all a step above. And that's why I wanted to stop at this map, just to give you some ideas that if you see these in a wine shop, by the way, they're almost all white. They're almost all going to be Chardonnays. They make very few reds in Macon. They do a few, and if it is, it's going to be Pinot Noir. Yeah, it could be Beaujolais, but it's typically Pinot Noir. Uh, but that is, in fact, what you're going to get. Up in the Chalonnay, which is at the top of the thing, <clears throat> there they make both reds and whites and some wonderful towns up there but we only have so much time okay so the wine that we're going to have now is the macon village and by the way partially for the american market though they've actually been doing this for several years now you say it you see that it says chardonnay on the label and again i always take just the very top off and of course put the worm in the middle and turn the corkscrew get in there deeply enough the doubled ones make it quite easy to get it out and we have a nice cork which is actually they don't say which one but it's actually one of the sort of um cork that's been probably de or something in other words this is not completely natural cork they break it down and put it back together and they treat it so that usually these wines, in fact, a number of the corks now are absolutely uh, guaranteed not to give the wine that musty aroma that we call corked in them. So this is the Mecon Village. So let's try this wine. Again, I think you'd be hard pressed, maybe a little more golden than the, um, uh, than the Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, yes, most definitely. Even though this wine sees no oak, again, just that beautiful pale straw, absolutely clear, limpid. And you smell this wine, swirl it and smell it. And 
I, I just, I find this wine to be just, I mean, just an amazing value. It has that, you know, again, a little bit of lemon, almost a little bit of Meyer lemon to it. There is certainly a stony minerality to that. Almost a little bit of flowers in that wine also. Just a beautiful expression of Chardonnay. And of course, if you taste this wine, Mm. but you know so much more and nothing wrong of course because it's a different grape it's a different, has a presence in the mouth you know has a weight in the mouth you know that you're drinking you're not drinking water you're drinking something with a little bit of weight to it and there again is that sort of chalky minerality uh that is there the wonderful sort of lemon uh also some other fruits there, so a little bit of tropical fruit, um, just delicious. And this is, I was surprised because I had it outside, but it's a little cold. Uh, it warms up a little bit. It will, in fact, only get better, trust me. Just, oh, that nose is so, just so penetrating, really beautiful. Some things about this wine. This is made by Louis Jadot. Uh, Louis Jadot has been a negociant. There's a term for you. You see the word negotiate. This is a person who buys wine from other producers, but they also own their own vineyards. In fact, they actually started in like 1826. They bought what is called the Clos de Usseuse, which is, again, one of the best vineyards in Burgundy. Uh, and they own many, I think they own over 500 acres now. So they are a very large owner. And of course, at the same time, they are a very large négociant, meaning that they buy grapes for the most part, and maybe sometimes wine from other producers or other vineyardists, and then sell the wine under their name. Uh, as you can see, in fact, I'll go back there, that beautiful, of course, that typical flower label, and you see uh, founded in 1859, because the Negos, uh, in other words, to, the Negociant was founded in 1859, but they were in the wine business before that as a seller. And this, of course, is their wonderful round, as you can see here, their wonderful round uh, winery uh, that is there with these open top tanks. Most of the tanks you're seeing there are, of course, for Pinot Noir, because the two grapes in Burgundy are Chardonnay, which, of course, you're drinking, and Pinot Noir, uh, which makes the great red burgundies. And so when you drink a, well, typically a Saint-Labin uh, or um, a, you know, any of the wines from the from the north, from the Cote de Nuit, uh, you are certainly drinking oh, things like Claude de Vougeot or Romani Conti or something like that, Von Rominet. They're all, in fact, red grapes from the Pinot Noir in there. Uh, this is their winemaker, uh, Jacques Ladier. Uh, was for many years uh, theirs. And in fact, it's interesting because Jadot bought land in Oregon. Um, I think their place is called uh, Renaissance. And uh, Jacques moved, in fact, there to run. This is their current winemaker, Vanier, uh, who is the winemaker there in the uh, uh, for them in there. Uh, just a picture of, in fact, part of their vineyards. Absolutely, Burgundy is just gorgeous with all these small plots owned by many, many different people in there. As I mentioned, it's 100% Chardonnay. Uh, there is no oak in this wine. And of course, very often you will find oak in Chardonnay. But typically, as you go further up, as I say, if you were having a Pouligny Morache uh, or something that would be from that area or Le Morache or Merceau, you would find oak in the wine, or even a top Puy Puisse, like Domaine Ferret. They probably use some oak, but the more everyday whites tend to be much more uh, without oak or with very little oak. And of course, these, and you can almost tell, it's a fallacy to say that, you know, the chalk and the limestone comes out, that you're tasting the soil, it simply isn't true, but it does, change the character of the wine. And in fact, these vineyard soils have a lot of chalk and limestone, which is very, very common uh, in this area. I, I, again, 
especially for the price, this wine is just amazing. And 2020, in fact, was a very nice year. Hmm. Questions, Emily? Yeah, one that came in says, when you leave a bottle of wine open for too many days, it loses flavor. So how does the wine not lose its flavor in an open top vat? Great question. The thing is, is an open top vat, they only use the open top vats for reds. And reds have tannins in them. And that is protective of, uh, of both spoilage and uh, having too much air. Also, as soon as you put it in, the lightest part of, again, with red wines, when you're doing it, you have what is called must. And so you have the juice, the skins, the seeds, everything together. But what happens is that the skins rise to the top and they make what we call basically the cap. And so that protects it. And so you're not getting air down in there. And it's really interesting. And I, I've gone to so many seminars. Many people will tell you, in fact, that that wine making is basically controlling the amount of oxygen to the grape or to the wine as it is fermenting and you do want a little bit especially with reds whites no whites you do want them in a closed container where they are fermenting because you ferment them cooler and you don't want to get rid of those aromas and flavors reds are a much higher temperature and the cap in fact you almost have the opposite problem because what's in, as we talked about, what's in the skins, flavors and aromas, and so and color especially. So you want to get that color in there. And so we actually push the cap into the juice by either pumping over or punching down or a, you know, a third thing where we sort of have it in a rotor fermenter. And so that's what we do. But because of the tannins and the other aspects and actually the anthocyanins too, in the wine and the grapes, they protect against the oxidation. And so you don't need to worry about exposing it to oxygen anywhere near as much as you would a white. Okay. And then another question came in about one of the pictures you showed. Mm -hmm. um, they want to know, was there a purpose behind the dome shape of the building in the picture that you showed? I'm trying to think. I know I did show you some. I did show you some domes uh, in making the prosecco, and that's because, of course, it's under pressure, and so you don't want a flat top. You want a rounded top because it holds the pressure better. So that might have been. Oh wait, here you mean? If they mean there, I think so yeah. Yes. Well, the reason being is having a round building and having that is that you can see they can of course very easily get to all of the tanks etc that are all around the outside so it is a good question because in fact you see it as a circular thing like this and of course you see the um you see the various ma machinery etc so you can actually bring the grapes in or the juice in from outside and by having those you know the various lines and spouts that you can put them then into all of the containers and so that's why round works very well for them. Not to mention, of course, it looks wonderful. And then but, um, one more. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Ellen said, you warm the, the Jadot a little in your hand, saying this is a little cold. Can white wine be too cold? Oh, oh, oh <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Especially. <clears throat> it's a shame he's probably not listening. Um, but again, I understand. I, if you were in Oxford, you are familiar with Crew, which is the wine bar. Well, of course, in their holding area for their whites, they also keep beer. Beer needs to be good and cold. Wines, not so much. And so whenever I buy either a bottle of wine or I get a glass of wine at Crew, the first thing I do is, of course, hold it in my hands for at least three to five minutes because well, you all know. I mean, you open, you put it in the pot, and you can barely smell it. And then, of course, when you heat it up, you can smell it all through the house. And so it's the same way. You want to get the aroma compounds into the air. And if it's too cold, we simply say the wine is dumb. 
because it has no aroma in it. I, I always to laugh too. Again, this has been a long time ago, but many of you might remember Cold Duck, which was a sparkling burgundy, or obviously it wasn't burgundy, but it was a sparkling red wine. Typically on the label, I love this, typically on the label it said, serve very cold. And I think the only reason is because it would get past your taste buds and down your gullet before you actually had a chance to taste it because it wasn't very good. And so, and so that's what happens. Great. Thank you. Um, that's the last one about these wines, Off but someone wants to know, they said, um, we've enjoyed all of your sessions throughout the pandemic, which we counted, Jack and I counted today. And I think it's 13 that we've done. Yeah. He said, can we get credit, a class credit added to our Miami transcript, <laughs> which would be very funny. Good idea. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to talk to <laughs> about that. You know, of course, there probably would have to be money involved. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I mean, they bought all these bottles of wine. That counts, Am right? Am I allowed to say that? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll be back. And by the way, here is a Vex and Wine Tasting Notes of this wine. Uh, bright white flowers, no questions. Apple, certainly there. Citrus aromas, bracing feet, clean. Classic expression. They say an aperitif with shellfish, crab cakes, or goat cheese. And it got a 91 for the tasting panel. Again, an icon of creamy, abundance of citrus accent with lemon curd and lemon blossom to tangerine sorbet. Minerality plays a starring role, no question, along with a fine acidity. It is a lovely wine. Uh, and especially, you know, for the price, uh, you it's one of those you just simply cannot beat. And that's typical of Chateau. I mean, they really have been a wonderful producer at all price levels. And trust me, you can get into some of their wines at hundreds of dollars a bottle. So we will continue our movement through France. And our next wine is also a screw cap. Uh, this is Belle Rouge. Uh, as you can see, it's made by Marcel Chapoutier. Uh, this is from the Rhone, and we'll talk a little bit about it. In fact, actually, you see it. Coats, by the way, the word coats means hills. And so these are the hills around the Rhone River Valley that is there. And of course, you see, oh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, again, it's really good if I look at the if I look at the pictures. Uh, because you see that it says on the Côte de Rhone, it says Appellation d'Origine Protique. And that's relatively new, or you don't see that so often on bottles of French wine. Because in France, traditionally, well, since the 30s, you have had, it would be Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. In other words, appellation, we use the word appel or something, name, of origin, d'origine, and the French method that, in fact, has been in place for a long time is control. So it's controlled or name of origin. In other words, where it comes from, it comes from a geographically delimited area. The EU has an overarching thing that, of course, is true for all the countries. And so... They, of course, depending on which country you are in, uh, obviously the name's going to be different because it'll be in German or French or Italian, but in French, it's Appellation d'Origine Protect. So it's a protected name of origin, and that's what they call it, or ADP. Uh, and so that's interesting that they use that instead of the typical French, that they use, in fact, the sort of, I guess you'd almost say more modern um, uh, uh, EU uh, term for this. So I think that's interesting. Uh, by the way, typically most Cote de Rhone, as someone in fact ask, are red. I would bet my guess would be 95% uh, are red, but you can also get rosés. So maybe a little lower, but you can get rosés in this. But again, whites are not as common, but in fact can be very good. And this, of course, is a screw cap. By the way, Marcel Chapotier makes amazing wines, and in fact, at all price levels. This, of course, is one of his entry-level wines, but he makes wines literally, again, into the hundreds of dollars a bottle. So this is Belle Rouge Cote de Rhone Blanc, a white wine. Again, actually a little more golden, probably than the last two. I seem to see a little bit of bubbles 
Uh, in the wine, still there, not surprisingly. I don't know if I'll see any eventually on the edge, but I do see a little bit of bubbles in this wine. And so again, let's swirl and smell this wine before we talk about it. So different, uh, more herbal, almost a little minty. You know, sort of interesting to get those herbs out of there. Also, though, a wonderful vein, almost pineapple. Really, very pretty. Um, doesn't come out of the no, uh, come out of the glass. I would say as as much as the Chardonnay, but still has a really lovely aroma. Oh yeah, and as you swirl it, it gets to be. And of course, you taste this wine. Mm -mm. You know, this is what makes tasting wine so interesting. I mean, these flavors are completely different than what you tasted in the in the other wines. You know, it has more depth. It has a, um, I, I don't even know exactly how to describe that. It, it's almost a little drying, almost a little bit like a dried apricot uh, flavor and feeling in the mouth. It's still very clean, um, just, you know, beautiful flavors, but just, again, has a different kind of depth to it than the other one did, you know, and I mean, both of them very, and the thing is how different they are, but yet at the same time, how good they are. I, I Again, I just think this wine is amazing for what it is in there. So pretty, just so neat. Very, almost has a, a little bit of an iron, sort of that, you know, very sort of like wet stone to it. Of course, I'm not sure the last time I sort of, end up sucking on a wet stone but it sort of reminds you of that sort of that almost like that whole idea of like a spring like a mountain stream beautiful some stuff about this wine this of course in fact this is from the society of wine educators as you can see there's france up in the corner this of course is in the far south and the rhone river valley of course has been very important since roman times or possibly before and in the north you have very very fine producers and very small areas Cote Roti, uh, Saint Joseph, Hermitage, Corna, etc. And then, of course, you get to the south, and all of a sudden it's like gigantic. I mean, literally over 200,000 acres under vine down there. And your basic wine is Cote de Rhone. Above that is Cote de Rhone Village, and we'll talk about this. And then, as you can see, there are a number of areas that were considered good enough to have their own name. So they're just not Cote de Rhone. In fact, they, Lirac is a good example. It sort of came out of all of that. The most famous one, of course, uh, in fact, you can see the name at the very bottom, is Chateauneuf de Pape, which is right there north of Avignon uh, in there. Um, and actually, uh, you know, we don't have time to talk about this, but um, the Pope, of course, moved to Avignon um, and lived there. In fact, there were like three legitimate popes who were there. So he built a summer palace. That's where the 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 pop comes from the Chateau Neuf, the new palace of the Pope, because in fact he built it just right outside the city, up on these hills, where of course it was cooler. It was away from the mosquitoes. It was away from all of the other problems that are there, and so it's considered the best area in the south. But Cote de Rhone, and of course this this white is beautiful. But Cote de Rhone's, I feel, are some of the best values in the world. They're medium bodied. They make great food wines. You can probably find most of them in the $15 range or less. And so obviously some more expensive, and we'll talk about the gradations in them. But they are really wonderful wines, typically blends of grapes, uh, both, in fact, as you will see, both reds and whites. Um, this, in fact, again, like we saw in the other one, this is the pyramid of this. At the bottom is just simply Cote d'Aron. Um, and of course, which didn't come from any of those areas, as I said probably about 200,000 acres. Above that is the Cote de Rhone Village, and typically those are a lot better. Above that 
you are also called Cote de Rhone, but they will have a specific name of a town. And so the town can append it on there. As you can see, there's 21 towns that are there. And then at the very top are the places like Cote Froti, Chateau Neuf de Pop, Lirac, uh, Vinsorbs, uh, Gigonda. Uh, again, the very specific best of the best in this area. Uh, and some of those, in fact, don't have to be tremendously expensive. Uh, but they are very good. In fact, actually, I pulled some bottles out tonight, basically just to sort of have them around. But one of them, in fact, is, if you think about it when I did it, uh, this, of course, is Chateauneuf de Pop. Um, and it is View Telegraph, one of the best. And this wine, of course, is just crazy. It's 1995. Uh, and um, uh, I hope is still drinking beautifully, uh, even after all of this time. Uh, and so, but this is one to be one of the crews, the top names, and this is of course the a wine from the best area in the um, in the south. So that's sort of very nice in all of that uh, with that. Okay, this of course is what the area looks like along the Rhone River. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is in fact is looking at uh, Chateau Neuf. Uh, again, it was, in fact, it was destroyed a long time ago, and then, of course, it was further destroyed in World War II, but that is, in fact, the town of Chateau Neuf de Pop, and, of course, you see uh, basically the ruins of the chateau there at the very top of the hill, and the, and the wines are just are wonderful. This wine, as you can see, is a blend of, in this case, Grenache Blanc, which, of course, is the white variety of Grenache, Roussan and Viognier. Uh, Roussan, again, wonderful wines. Viognier gives a, this is what gives this wine a little bit of that uh, that nice aromatic, and then Claret, Claret de Dee is another one, and Bourbon. So it's actually a blend of five different grapes there. Uh, the stony moral soils again, limestone. Want to quickly help the grapes get thing. It was spent five months aging on fine lees. In other words, it was probably in older tanks, but they left it on a thin layer of the yeast. To give it again a little bit more of that roundness that they the weight to the wine uh by the way interesting and we talked about that i just talked about this in class harvest is carried on at night by machines because it's cool at night and so again you don't get oxidation and you it preserves the aroma you also have less chances of of having um fungi and off colors and all those things uh destemmed uh, light skin maceration, in other words, they leave it on the skins for a little bit of time, uh, and then they do a cool fermentation, not surprising, in stainless steel, uh, and that's what they do, and so this wine probably sees no oak um, at all in there. It really is. It is a, it is a lovely little wine. Uh, yeah, especially even after a little time, it just that, again, it's that sort of mountain stream kind of aroma. It's just so beautiful. Questions, Emily? Yes, yes, we have some. Okay. Um, for wines from the same varietal and same vineyard, what determines the difference in price point? Uh, say that again. I'm sorry. Um, so for wines from the same varietal and same vineyard, what determines the difference in their price point? Well, it probably isn't from the same vineyard. Um, it might be from the same area, and there may be better areas within that uh, that place. And as you'll find, uh, though California is the same way. Um, actually, let's use California simply because uh, it might be a little bit more understandable than France. Um, you can buy a wine, and typically, and I'm I'm going to throw out numbers just to give you an idea. But you can buy a wine that basically is that's from Napa County, and it may be 20 years old, and then or 20 dollars, excuse me, and so then you may have a wine from a that again maybe a blend from Yonville, and so that wine may be 35 or 40 dollars, and then you will go within Yonville, you will have a specific winery, and maybe they actually have several different vineyards. And so uh, maybe the blend of their vineyards might be $60. And maybe they really feel that one of the vineyards is in fact better than all the rest. And so that they will charge $80 for. 
And so this is how a lot of this is. And of course, it's part of it is the market and what the market will bear and what people's ideas of the wines are. But that's pretty much how it works. I mean, for example, last semester, I used because, well, for a number of reasons, but I used, um, again, a stag's leap that was at, I think, like $40 and a stag's leap that was at $60. And just to look to see, can we discern a difference? And they were both made by Stag's Leap, but one was a specific vineyard and the other one was a blend. And it's like, and so does it hold up? You know, and so the market decides, et cetera. So that I think is getting to the crux of what the person is asking. Perfect. Um, thank you. And then a couple people said that they had the red version of this wine instead of oh, the sure. white. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a rosé also of Belle Rouge. Oh, Okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. just all made by the same. All made by Marcel Chapoutier. And in fact, I really feel badly. I should know what Rouge means because Belle, of course, is beautiful. Uh, and I don't, and I, I didn't see anywhere they didn't make it plain exactly what that means. And my French isn't good enough uh, yeah. to tell you. If someone is, they can, in fact, write in and tell me. <laughs> uh, so I, again, that's, it's called crowdsourcing. And so, uh, uh, and so, yes, so I don't know, but they do. And, I have used the red in class several times. It is it is a classic red uh, Cote de Rome. You know, typically not very heavy. Um, usually a little bit of uh, almost like a little jammy uh, in the fruits. Um, sometimes and yeah, medium bodied, just easy drinking. Great with a red sauce. Great with you know any number of sort of medium weight foods. Wonderful wines. I'm a big fan of Cote de Rome and Bapolicella for that reason. Anything else? Yeah, one more about this wine. Um, a couple people noticed that there's Braille on the label. Um, are they just being inclusive or is there a specific reason that this winemaker would, would do that? Do you know? And if you oh, don't, that's okay. They were just actually, curious. Actually, that's really interesting that you would because they are not, now you're really going to bother me. Maybe if I take a second, I will actually go in to see who makes La Cizeran. Uh, because they've always had Braille on theirs also. Uh, and I might be, it might be Chapoutier. I may take a quick, I may make a quick run over there in a minute just to find out if I can. But yeah, they've always done that. I think Chapoutier has done. And as to why, Again, it never shows up on their website. I will have somebody look that up. Great. Thank you. Um, sure. And that is the last question about this wine. Beautiful beehive. Oh, Belle Rouge means beautiful beehive. I learned one thing already. Thank you. Now, can you find out why they use Braille on their uh, thing? I'm going to keep my friends busy here. It's the only thing I need to do. By the way, I should finish. Chupoutier offers, again, I could not agree more, offers exceptional and everyday op option for the talented winemaker Michel Chupoutier, uh, a, a thing that is complex with aromas of apricot, fennel, and floral scents. He got 89 from the enthusiast. I like this. Whispers of smoke and hazelnut skins uh, accent fresh, cutting white peach and pear. In his full body, yet zesty, dry, predominantly Grenache Blanc. Sumptuous sip giving lift and edge by small portions of Claret and Bordelon. The finish is intensely mineral, lingering on a delicious salty tang, which in fact, I never think, think about that, but it does really have that saline to it. Best enjoyed young. And of course, it's from Terlato, which is a big um, uh, importer from Chicago. Acrobat. So I want to give me a the answer. Oh, good. And could I have the Acrobat, please? Oh, that's right. I do have it. Sorry, my fault. Mea culpa. While we're um, sure. While you're yeah. getting ready, I was just going to mention to people that you are at home this week. We usually do these tastings in the Merstein um, Alumni Center basement, um, but Jack is actually in his home this week. Yes. So I just wanted to mention that for oh, our viewers you. that are wondering. And then another mention uh, or another thing is Jack mentioned alumni weekend um, and the wine tasting happening at alumni weekend that 
registration will open up mid-March. It's supposed to open up March 15th, March 14th. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Great. Thanks, Emily. Not a problem at all. That's excellent. Uh, by the way, they also looked it up. Um, again, Chaputier and other winemakers use Braille to make it easier for people to pick out bottles um, who are not sighted. And so that's really just a wonderful idea. And so uh, very, very neat to see. Okay. So the next wine that we are doing is Acrobat Pinot Noir from Oregon. And so let's taste the wine first. First of all, and again, you probably have it in front of you, but you can see, in fact, my glass. Look how light it is. It is just amazingly uh, light in color. And in fact, I've probably had some rosés. In fact, they're this dark. But this is, again, it's partially my opinion, but the way it is, this is how a Pinot Noir should be. They should not be too dark. I really think that that really lovely, so beautiful cherry red color, with it should come through with that without any difficulties. By the way, if you are in fact seeing this on camera, you see, in fact, I did decide to bring down a burgundy glass. These larger glasses, in fact, work very, very well with Pinot Noirs. They hold in the thing. And I tend not to be a person like, oh, you've got to use a certain glass. Uh, you know, I'd rather not use a jam jar or something like that. And I prefer having my wines with a stem or the glass with a stem uh, and certainly do. Uh, but again, I, I'll be honest, I got a great buy on these burgundy glasses. So I have plenty of them, and so I really enjoy using them. The color is just beautiful. And again, if you swirl, as I've been doing, this wine and smell it. Oh, isn't that nice? I'm sorry, I really love Pinot Noir. I guess you figured that out by now. It's it's just, it's cherries but it's got this soft, almost sandalwood to it. It's just so elegant and just seductive. It, just a beautiful nose. Ugh. And of course, if you taste this wine. Mm. It's surprising in some ways because the aroma is softer, etc. But the wine has real depth to it and has, again, you still have the cherries, but I'm getting more of that sort of forest floor. I'm getting a real grip to this wine. Obviously, there's tannins in this wine, which makes it, you know, certainly eminently drinkable, but makes it a wonderful food wine. You know, because it, it has the ability to cut through fats and to and to really make something you know go very well. And this can be, I think, especially because of this, the uh, smoky aromas, it can certainly be roasted vegetables. It can be mushrooms. Obviously, it can be salmon. It can be uh, lamb. Any number of things that this wine can go with very, very, very well in there. Just really wonderful. This, of course, is made, Acrobat is owned by a fairly large company. In fact, it's all part of Bob Foley's uh, winery or wine kingdom, shall we say, coming in a number of places. And um, Acrobat owns a number of vineyards in the Willamette Valley, which is there in the top of Oregon, as you can see here. They also own vineyards in Umpqua, which is the next one down. And they also have two or three vineyards in the Rogue Valley, which is, in fact, far down there to the south in Oregon. And of course they own Pinot Gris vineyards and a number of other uh, vineyards too in uh, in Oregon. But these show you in fact the AVAs and that's where Acrobat makes their grapes. And of course this is their entry level wine and so it probably is a blend of those areas. Um, they in fact have on their website uh, probably about a, uh, at least a dozen different vineyards uh, with the pictures of the various vineyards. I picked out some of the most beautiful ones as you can see absolutely gorgeous uh there here of course is another one uh of them it's wonderful surrounded by those woodlands uh that are there truly amazing in there uh the wine of course is made is cold soaked a cold soak means that what they've done they take they take the grape off of the stems <clears throat> they then just basically let them sit there 
pre-fermentation. And so that's what they mean by a cold soak. It could be for a few days or whatever, because you get out uh, different compounds from this. Then, of course, they add, typically will probably add yeast. Obviously, during the fermentation, they will punch down and or pump over. And then, of course, it went through um, malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation happens with most reds, meaning that in the wine is malic acid, which is a fairly strong acid. It's the acid in apples. And then, of course, it is changed by a bacterium into lactic acid, which is the acid in milk, which is much softer because you take out an acid. So that's what they do in stainless steel. It's then aged for eight months in 25% new oak, French oak. In fact, the rest of it is probably either in stainless steel, etc. cetera. Um, uh, again, it was a classic vintage in 2019, and it got 90 points in the enthusiasts. Again, Fragrant and spicy, which it is, right? Very fruit, earthy stiffness. Again, I, I mentioned that. Coming through with the tannins, that's certainly another way to put it. The balance overall works in the wine, though chewy, which it certainly is, will knock it out of the park with salmon. And of course, it's, you know, it's almost a, you know, it's a given in many ways, or it's almost cliche to say that Pinot Noirs will work with salmon, but there is no question that this wine will work beautifully with salmon. Very nice. Lovely wine. Any questions, Emily? Yes. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, somebody said, didn't find the Acrobat, but we're drinking the Erath Organ. I might have said that completely nope, wrong. I'm sure. Right. Yep. 2019. Yeah. Have you tried this? And if so, any similarities? Um, and then a couple of people did get the A to Z Pinot Noir. Um, they wanted to know if you had anything to say about that as well. Actually, and by the way, I apologize. I have no idea. Again, Acrobat, A to Z. Hey, they're close. Uh, so sue me. But what happened was, yes. I, I'll be honest, I made the mistake. And so as soon as I realized, in fact, in talking to the rep that I had made the mistake, I changed immediately. But at the same time, voila, I have the A to Z, thanks to friends of mine, so that in fact, we could compare them. And so I, I opened the A to Z, in fact, right now, so that we could. Color, very much the same. I think it'd be very, it might be a little bit redder. A little bit, you know, darker than, in fact, the Acrobat is. But if you smell this wine, also darker. Uh, I think richer uh, in a different way, though. It, it doesn't really have the fruit that jumps out at you, the cherry. It has more of that forest floor, a darkness to it. Yes, and almost, um trying to think more, I smell cranberries. And almost, almost going to plum and a little bit of pepperiness. Now, of course, and now it comes out sort of always interesting. You know, you do, and then all, all of a sudden, now I'm getting almost a little bit of a uh, 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 VA, almost a little bit of uh, acid coming out of it. Yeah, no wine changes more in the glass than Pinot Noir. I mean, this wine has already gone through two or three transfers. Like, oh, I smell that. Oh, I smell that. Because now it's starting to open up with a very floral note. Wow, just amazing. And of course, if I taste this wine, and you could do the same if you have it. Hmm. Also, very, very nice. A little softer, a little rounder. In other words, it's a little bit more sort of roundness and softness on the palate uh, than uh, the Acrobat. Tasty. You know, it really does have that. In fact, it, boy, it, it is where the Acrobat still had more of that sort of earthy forest floor. And I apologize. Again, just because of time, I wasn't sure I was going to have the wine, so I didn't really look up there, uh, you know, any kind of uh, of what 
the experts may have had to say about this, but it is, it's softer. It's, it's absolutely delicious. I mean, it really is. There's certainly nothing wrong with this wine at all. And it's just basically two different looks at very nice Pinot Noirs. Yeah. It's a little, what's the alcohol on the, uh, on the A to Z in comparison to the Acrobat? Five, A to Z. A to Z is 13.5. Acrobat. Just curious. It's not very... Oh, here we go. 13.5. 13.5. For some reason, I got a little bit more alcohol out of the uh out of the ac out of the a to z than i did in the acrobat the thing is what's interesting is of course you have a percentage either way uh and maybe because it's just softer and so you notice the alcohol a little bit more but both i hope in fact if so if you do have the other one uh, again i that's why in fact i made sure i picked up a bottle uh very nice wine very nice wine questions emily um there more general questions than specific to these wines, so I can save them until the end. That's fine. Yep. So we'll continue on. Bing. Uh, our last wine, in fact, we've gone off to Italy, uh, Brancaia. Uh, this, is, of course, is called Tre. Um, it's from Toscana. And by the again, there's so much you can just learn from wine just by looking at it. It's from Tuscany, Toscana. <clears throat> As you see in the bottom, it says Indicazione Geografica Tipica. That means, of course, that in fact, it's not a Chianti. It's not from any of the, in Italy, it would be DOC, DOCG sites. DOC, Denominazione de Origin Controllata. Uh, in other words, a controlled area, just as we saw in, in France. Uh, this is from a much larger area. And one of the reasons is, is because this wine is called Tre because it literally comes from three different vineyards, two which are in Chianti, and the other one, which is in a completely different area called Maremma. And so that's why. So let's see. Let me open this bottle. <clears throat> There we go. Sorry, maybe I should have opened this beforehand. There. Nice cork. Actually, very nice cork. Actually, no, I do as I said, very nice. Now I realize. It's actually not cork. It's actually, in fact, plastic, uh, which, of course, is perfectly fine. And for this or their entry-level wine, I'm not surprised. But, of course, it says Brent Kai on the side and so has some other things about it. And, of course, has its uh, website on there. You know, of course, it's, it's URL and the whole bit as it is. So, again, if I pour this wine, not dark. You know, again, Italian wines, for the most part, things like Sangiovese, etc., are not that dark. And this, of course, is much darker than the uh, Pinot Noirs uh, that we just had, but it certainly is not a Cabernet uh, and those kind of things. You can certainly sort of see through it. And it surely has very nice color uh, in, uh, in it. And so if you swirl and smell this wine, oh, so juicy. I mean, that's the first thing that comes out. It's just this really wonderful red fruit. And it's red. It's really bright, bright fruits. Not really strawberry, but I'm thinking cherries and plums. And just, you know, really fresh. Almost, a, you know, again, almost a cranberries in there. Mm, just so nice. And there's, at the same time, there's a little bit of a depth, there's a little bit of backbone, a little darkness to that wine also. And of course, if you taste this wine, mm. 
The wonderful thing about this wine is it's rich without being overpowering. Woo, though, tremendous amount of fruit in that finish. And it really is just, you know, sort of really, it's big but not heavy, which is what I like. It's got really good acidity, uh, which really does. And the thing is, is what's funny is about this wine is it tastes Italian. And even though, as you'll see, the grape varieties are what we normally think of more as French or Californian, it really has those flavors. And I find that amazingly how often, in fact, that happens. So a little bit about this wine. It is, in fact, here you see where Tuscany is in Italy. It's over there on their west coast and, in fact, very much into the mountains. You see Firenze, which of course is Florence, and then <clears throat> Chianti. Um, it just says Chianti Classico, but there's a number of Chianti regions that are there, just south of Florence, towards Siena, sort of in between. Um, and there, there are two of the of the grapes we're having. Two of the wineries, or two of the uh, the vineyards, are in Chianti. In Chianti, down to the south is Maremma, Toscana. And it's really interesting. The Italians have been making wine for literally thousands of years. And yet, having said that, both Maremma and to an extent Bulgari, which you see just slightly to the north there, they never thought about growing grapes there or that they could make fine wine there. They realized that they were wrong. And so, in fact, both of these areas have become very, very good wine-making areas. Now, Marema is where the third winery, this is why this wine is called Tre, because the grapes come from two vineyards in Chianti and one in Marema. By, by the way, I decided I would show you. This, of course, this map shows you Tuscany. And, of course, it shows you Chianti and Marema. Um, this is not even close to all of the different wines that are made in Tuscany, which is why it's so interesting. So I thought I would show you this map. And this, of course, crazy map shows you, in fact, all of the possible wines that can be gotten within Tuscany. And many of them, like Pomino, I have never tasted. Or Bianco della Valle di Neviole, I have no idea. Colline, which is hills, again, in Italian, uh, around Luca, and so Colline Lucchesi, uh, and, of course, the wines around Pistoia, etc. So it's just it's amazing how much is there. But, again, I thought it was just interesting to show you that, that this, of course, is all we're going to worry about, but these are the possibilities that, in fact, you could probably spend years trying to taste all of the various uh, Tuscan wines and I'd be happy to try, uh, but you would have a real hard time, in fact, finding some of these, of course, in America. You'd always have to go to those areas, in fact, to find them. Um, again, you know, it's so interesting about the wines, etc. This wine was made, this couple that you see in this picture in 1981, I just love it. Again, what, 40 years ago now, um, they are Swiss. Uh, and they bought the first winery that was basically abandoned. And very quickly, uh, you know, there were just a few acres of grapes, and they sort of started renovating, and, and I don't know exactly where, obviously, they had money uh, to do this, but they started renovating everything. And then later on, they bought a second wine, vineyard, which, again, had been completely um, uh, left for ruin. Uh, and then, of course, bought the area later in Marema, and so they own three. But so, again, it was just great because this is the picture of them in 1981. Here are the picture of them, in fact, in 2020. As I said, uh, Brigitta, who, of course, is the wife, uh, was an enologist. Uh, Bruno, her husband, I'm not sure what. In fact, they just celebrated their 80th birthdays, uh, as I found in looking at all of this as the history. Most of the areas are completely organic. 
Uh, and they, in fact, make a number of different wines. This one, in fact, sort of being more of their entry-level wines. Um, some pictures, again, just makes me want to go there. This, of course, is one of their properties. Uh, there's another picture. I think that's actually the same property, just a different view of the vineyards. Uh, this, is, of course, is Chianti. Uh, this is another picture of one of the vineyards, the other one in Rada in Chianti. Uh, and this, of course, is the winery in Maremma. So again, just absolutely beautiful and so typically uh, typically Tuscan uh, to go and visit. Uh, as I said, they're completely organic. Uh, and so you have things like this with the peas and the other flowers growing in between the vines. And I realized, it took me a while to realize that those are the vines in leaf along the edge, very, very low cordons. In other words, just sort of amazing how low those vines are, which of course are just starting to grow. This is probably a picture taken in early May would be my guess uh, in all of that. Uh, again, very modern, obviously had done things. This is in fact one of their cellars. Uh, I mean, absolutely beautiful, beautiful places in all of that. As I mentioned, Trey stands for three grape varieties. It is a blend of Sangiovese, which of course is the typical grape of Tuscany of Chianti. Merlot and Cabernet, of course, both international varieties. And of course, there are three Tuscan estates, the basis for this wine. Um, red fruit, which of course is certainly there, juicy and ready to drink. Elegant, well-structured. It spends one year in French oak uh, and cement. I have a feeling that most of that oak is probably not new. It is 80% Sangiovese, 10% Merlot, 10% Cabernet. And even though it is in fact 80% Sangiovese, um, you really get a lot of the the riches and the fruit from the Merlot and the Cabernet uh, in that wine, but very, very nicely, beautifully blended together. Uh, in fact, they say this structure is ready for dinner now, a, a price to keep in hand, the kitchen wine rack. Uh, they say core of black cherry. I can see that. I don't get so much the chocolate with hints of orange. I can see the orange peel. Soft and easy, not pleasant and spice to keep you in your toes. Entry level offers a great balance of elements with a fresh, tangy finish that can't help but satisfy this why you got 91 from vinus silky tannins black cherry plum leather licor licorice espresso nicely balanced that you don't miss it and 90 from suckling plums chocolate hints of orange peel and i sort of get the orange especially in the finish medium body fresh in the finish tangy with a dusty texture questions emily Yes, we do have a few. Um, so somebody said, when serving a red, is it best to keep it in an open bottle or serve it in a decanter and why? First and foremost, it depends on the wine. If it is a very young wine and you think has a lot of tannins, it is not a bad idea to decant it and maybe even decant it an hour or two beforehand to give a wine a chance to breathe. I mean, even in some of the wines we've had this evening, you know, again, which are obviously not true, super expensive wines, how they change after a few minutes. And so it is, in fact, the interaction with the air that makes a difference in the wines. And so if you have a wine that you feel is fairly big and young, uh, then I would decant it beforehand. Otherwise, I, I'm not a big user of decanters. I like to see how it's going to change in the glass. Uh, and so that sort of makes it interesting. But again, I I am looking, you know, everyone knows, of course, I teach the wines class. And so I've been looking for what I call a big red. It's the first wines my students drink. And it's the last wine my students drink. And, and so I tasted one recently. And I basically said, yeah, could you pour this again for me in five years? Because again, it had so much tannin. I felt there was so much oak and it hid all the flavors. And, and seriously, I mean, obviously a relatively expensive wine, but I didn't want a second glass. I didn't want to check. I almost didn't want a second sip because it was just too tannic and closed, etc. And it's like, mm, this is, yeah, for some people, this is in their wheelhouse. For me, it's not. And so, Five years or maybe several hours in decanter would soften those tannins, etc. So that's when I would uh, decant. Be careful. 
older wines can break down fairly quickly if you decant. And so it is typically, if I'm going to decant something, it's going to be a fairly young tannic wine. Okay. Yeah, and this is kind of more of a general question as well. How does the rating system work? Is it done by price range, type of grape, et cetera? If a $20 wine rates 90 and a $50 bottle of wine rates 90, are they essentially the same? Very good question. I would hope yes, because um, I think that most of the rating systems are doing it blind. <clears throat> so they don't know exactly what they're drinking. And of course, certainly they should, or they may not know which sort of price range that they're drinking in because they should be um, the same. And trust me, I go through this all the time because you do see those scores that it's like, well, do I buy, you know, I could afford a case of wine that got a 90 as opposed to a single bottle that got a 95. It's like, uh, 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 you know, and again, part of it depends on, you know, occasion and those kinds of things. But for the most part, you know, I obviously, as we all do, we look for the best price quality ratio. So, yes, I hope that a $20 wine in, for example, a spectator gets a 90. It is an equivalent quality as a $50 wine. And actually, I see that a lot. If you look through the numbers, and I have, you know, because there's so many intangibles when it comes to wine. You know, it's like, oh, I had this in my cellar, or oh, this is a name, etc. Because there are lots of times I see wines at two, three hundred dollars, they get 90, 91, and then you'll see other wines that are at 15, 20, 25 dollars to get 90, 91. Well, lobby, it's fairly obvious what I'm gonna buy. Um, and so, um, because again, but because there's other intangibles, people buy those wines at those higher prices with the same scores. But I like to think that yes, that there is a, there's a parity there. Um, and of course, you know, part of it is depending on your own palate and that's not always easy to do. I have a few wineries and I wouldn't mind trying a few more just to make sure I'm right. But there are a few people I know who get 93, 94, 95 points. I hate those wines. I just, you know, it's like, no, it doesn't do it for me. And and so we're all not the same, and that's a good thing. And so, and I found that to be true. Other things. Yeah, um, I have one more, um, mm -hmm. and then we can finish okay. it up. Um, but before I go on, I wanted to say happy birthday to Jane Stewart, class of 67, who I know is tuning in. So cheers to you and happy birthday. Happy birthday. Um, so what foods go well with the last Italian um, bread that we tasted? Oh, geez. Um I would probably stick to an Italian. The first thing that comes to mind, uh, I, again, of course, you have to get, you can make it yourself, is brajol. Uh, which in fact is that beef which is sort of marinated and braised, um, I just think would be absolutely delicious. Um, a number of braises. I, again, I think about the onions uh, that of course get braised in it. And this also finishes, I'm looking to see if it doesn't know, of course it doesn't say it anywhere. I'm, oh, guess actually it is. This does finish with a hint of orange peel. Uh, and there's no question, I'm getting that in the finish. And there are some even Middle Eastern dishes that you could have. I think of, of things with lamb, etc., with a little bit of orange peel in the finish that I think would be just dynamite with this wine. Uh, but again, other, you know, you could certainly do a good, even just a good ragu bolognese. I mean, a, a nice, you know, rich sauce. Uh, this wine would just go beautifully with. Uh, yeah, I would stick to I would stick to Italy. I think for the most part, or as they said, Middle Eastern, where you can bring up a little bit of that that orange flavor would be really nice. Great, and the rest we'll save for the very end. Okay. Unless are you done, or do you? I'm, I'm basically done, except for a few pictures, etc. Okay, I'll give. Okay, I'll do. I'll do the the rest then. So there's two more I want to ask okay. you. 
Sure. Um, and I apologize. I know a lot of people have asked questions. So if we weren't able to get to your question tonight, I apologize. Um, but I'm going to end on these two if I can find them. <laughs> Oh goodness. Okay, there we are. So, um, with the same in the same line of food, are there any quick secrets to pairing wine and food for a novice wine drinker? For the most part, you want to connect like to like. Uh, for example, and you know, as I said, it's like Pinot Noir and salmon. They're just it's just a no brainer. The other thing too is obviously you can't change the wine but you can change the food to make it more wine friendly one of the things that we don't talk a lot when it comes to food is this idea of umami which is savoriness and and i have found and, and i will tell you I, I have no problem telling you all of my secrets uh is that when i do braises or i various things some of the things that i will add maybe a teaspoon to it well for example when you make a stew what does it very often tell you to do add a tablespoon or two of tomato paste why you'll never taste that tomato paste because it adds a depth and a savoriness to that wine so does and in fact you'll hear this from many many chefs like a teaspoon, you know, again, and you can either buy them ground or grind them yourselves, uh, dried mushrooms, because they're very high in umami and they make them much more, they add depth and make the wines and the food much more palatable. The other thing I will add that you'll never notice, again, is anchovy paste, same way, high in umami. Fish sauce, high in umami. You know, it's all of these things, and it doesn't take much, tablespoon or whatever in a, in a dish, it adds a depth of flavor that can, in fact, just simply, it deepens the flavor of the, of the food and makes it more wine friendly. So that's one of the things that, that I do a lot. Um, because again, and even it doesn't call for it. It's like, oh yeah, I put a little bit in because again, I know that it's, it's going to round up and, and deepen the flavor. So those are really, I think one of the really good, easy, quick, but it's like, why do we put Parmesan on on all these things? Same reason. It's because hard cheeses are very rich in umami. Not to mention they taste great. And so these are the kinds of things that we do. And and for me, I, again, if I could sort of impart one thing using any of those things, it, because again, you'll never taste the anchovies. Doing that can really, especially in the, still it's still winter with braises and stuff like that can be just wonderful. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, okay, last one. And again, I'm sorry we got so many questions. So I, I apologize if I was not able to get to your question. Um, and the thing is, if there's not many, Emily, if you want to forward them to me, I can try to find the time to answer them. I will certainly do so if I have time. Okay, there are, there are quite a few, but I will send it to you. And if you have time, um, feel free to go through them. Sure. If not, I completely understand. I'll do what I you're busy. Um, and I think others will understand as well. Okay. So what is the best online retailer to buy hard to find wines? And then also the wines that you suggest, what is, what do you think? And this is not an ad just for people. Sure. <laughs> of course it's not. Um, again, obviously you can use wine.com. My, my thing is, and I'll be honest. And in fact, I, probably should get rid of all of them on my computer are the flash sites. And um, it is, of course, knowing with anything, it's, you know, buyer be well, caveat emptor. Uh, but I use Last Bottle. I use WTSO. Uh, I use others. Oh, another one, too, that I started using or saw is Big Hammer Wines. Have some very interesting wines. Um, and so I look at a lot of the flash sites and see what comes. Um, and yes, so needless to say, UPS and FedEx love me. Uh, and uh, because and and so it's interesting. Again, I like trying different kinds. I mean, I have a couple of wines upstairs. It's like seriously, you bought those? Uh, but I, I bought a Hungarian formant 
recently and i bought a i think it is a lambrusco which actually has a a bottle cap top for it again because i thought oh this sounds really interesting and i like trying really different wines but otherwise wine.com uh i really feel i mean typically and they usually have some really good sales and there's wines that you can get uh for that um otherwise it's tough the bounty hunter let me tell you my real problem and that is the wine laws in america are terrible which is the nicest way i can put that and so one state gets wines that the other state does not you cannot easily send across state lines you know and it's not you know and and i under i sort of understand why but it really makes for example doing tastings like this it would be wonderful if i could make sure you could all across the country if not the rest of, get the same wines or that we could as alumni you could pay for them or you could send them to you but we can't and really that's the problem it's the question of of being able to get the wines um again very quickly i i read eric asimov he writes for the new york times and every six weeks or so he does a thing where he will pick out three wines for everyone then to to buy and taste and give their things and then he does a, an article about it very good i can never find those wines it's as simple as that you know they simply don't exist in ohio where they do in new york and and that really ends up being the horrendous problem when it comes to in fact finding wines luckily of course there's so many wines that it's not a real problem but uh, as i said those are some of the flash sites and those things that i really enjoy using and typically it's like get thee behind me satan so that i don't buy them because in fact sometimes it's way too tempting great okay. not is all the questions I have for this okay. evening. I, I will send along the questions to you. Um, Great. I have a few things to show you. One of them, of course, is those of you who have been there. Wildberry is, of course, still waving its flag. I happen to be uptown today and certainly took that picture uh, for them. In fact, you know, Mark Bialis, of course, is still running the place and doing very well. Um, I decided to go through again the Gog and Ice Arena, of course, was there. There were signups, of course, for everything. And so I took a couple pictures there. I thought also you might want to find um, that it, many of you probably spent time at Pepper Park. And we have put in, or they're still in the process of putting in a wonderful sort of bike and walking lane. And so they put this great new bridge over for the creek uh there going into pecker park uh and of course if you do or don't remember that of course is the shelter there at pepper uh with the trees and of course that's what it looked like this afternoon i thought i would show you this too of course you know that sort of um emily stomping grounds mersteen at the top but of course the hill at pepper um we had about a foot of snow not very long ago and so the you know again this is where everyone went typically with of course their trays from the dining halls uh to use uh and so i hear everyone had a marvelous time on that hillside a few weeks ago and again we'll see if the weather holds up next thursday we're supposed to have another six inches and so there may be people on that hillside again before spring comes the other thing I would show you, of course, is this is, in fact, and you, of course, would not recognize this. This is the bridge um, of 27. And this is uh, one more part of this wonderful walking, biking trail that goes through. And, of course, I walk through myself for the first time today. And there, of course, looking down is the creek. And it was just, it was so lovely to see today you know, to look down on the creek and see everything there. And so it just shows you, in fact, how nice uh, Oxford or any place, there are so many places in Ohio can be that make it really, really great. Here's another picture, in fact, of the same area, but with, in fact, this great uh, walking path, uh, et cetera, that is, in fact, uh, there. So I thought that was, in fact, uh, a little bit of Oxford to show you this evening. Um, again that when you come you can walk the trails and of course it's absolutely beautiful to be there 
Um, and again, I stopped over at Hall Auditorium, and so I had to take a picture of good old Hall, where I spent so much time, and hopefully you did too, listening to concerts and all kinds of things, and possibly classes too. Otherwise, which of course is a few days ago, uh, Miami, of course, founded in 1809. And thank you very, very much for joining. Thank you from me, and of course, from the Alumni Association. Have a lovely evening. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Jack, for your time tonight. As always, everyone absolutely loves this. Um, so thank you again for everyone out there joining us tonight. And a big thank you to you, Jack. Um, we had a lot of questions come in again, as I said, so I apologize if we were not able to get to your question. I invite you to check out our other Alumni Association webinars. They are free and open to all. And on our webinar site, alumlc.org backslash Miami OH. Um, we have virtual winter college coming up next week on February 25th and 26th. We have seven different webinars, including another cooking class with Lee Barnhart Oaks, class of 83 from Jungle Gyms. She will be cooking another fantastic meal. Um, the recipe is online if you want to follow along. Um, and we have six other wonderful presenters, um, all Miami authors, alumni, auth alumni or faculty authors. Um, so please be sure to tune into that. Again, thank you to you, Jack, and to all of our wonderful alumni, friends, and family tuning in. And love and honor. Have a great weekend.